name is Ritu Raman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. Outside of being like a woman and a scientist, the identity that probably resonates the most strongly with me is being an immigrant um, in the US. Um, so I was born in India, lived in India and Kenya when I was younger, and I moved to the U.S. when I was nine. So I'd say most of my lived experience has been in this country, but kind of at least originally from the perspective of somebody who was an outsider. You know, you do have this really strong sense of pride when you feel that everything that you have and you accomplish is something that you kind of build from the ground up. We, I think you have like a limit of how much money you're allowed to bring, so about like $500 and like that. So yeah. now to be a professor at MIT, to be a homeowner, to have an Ivy League degree, like all of these things are very meaningful to me. And I feel like they're things that we kind of earned together. It was me, my mom, and my dad. Um, my dad is a mechanical engineer, my mom's a chemical engineer. It took me a long time to even realize that there were not a lot of women engineers because one out of three people I knew was one. <laughs> that was really nice. And then I think my dad, seeing him sort of value her opinion on things, my mom and dad actually had a startup um, when I was a child together. So they built like efficient heat exchangers for factories together. And then my grandpa, he was probably the person that first put the idea of like being an engineer in my head. Cause like, oh, this thing's broken. Like we need to fix it. And then he would make me draw the thing that was broken from every angle. What's the front view, what's the top view, what's the side view of this thing. And then we'd be like, this is the part that we need that's broken. And then we'd like go on a quest. And then we would buy a bunch of stuff and then we'd come back and we'd build it and he would have some spare parts. And he'd be like, I'm gonna make you a skateboard. When I was really little, you know, I had sort of a very vast array of things I was interested in. I wanted to be, um, well, I wanted to be on the Indian national cricket team. And then I wanted to be a fashion designer. So like very broad, right? I really like space. So like, Anytime there's a rocket launch or thinking about going to space or other things, I'm like, that's cool. I would want to do that. The other thing is that I really, re I read a lot of books and I really like writing. I like the craft of writing and people seem to like the things that I wrote. So I felt like this is a skill that I have that's good. A lot of people, particularly in America and particularly my generation and younger, gotten mm -hmm. the advice of like, find your passion and then follow it and like everything will come into place. And I just think that this is really stupid advice. Most people have to make decisions for practical reasons. I was not passionate about mechanics or bioengineering or all these things. I needed a visa, needed to have a job and a home and to provide for my family. The way the green card system works in the US, which you may, you may or may not know is like, you age out of your parents' green card application when you turn 21. So even though I moved here when I was nine, mine was still being processed for a very long time. And so I was like, by the time I was 16 when I started college, so I knew by the time I graduated college, I'd be 20, and then I would need a job. And I didn't think, like if you look at most of the visas and who they go to, they go to people that are in tech. If I need to be on my own H-1B, it doesn't make sense for me to do anything that's not tech. It doesn't mean you can't be interested in and excited about what you do. Um, I would rather people think about like, what is a thing I really care about, whether it's like, climate change or space exploration or other things rather than passionate like here's a problem or a thing that people would really want solved does when things get hard you will still be able to get up the next day and go to work and work on this thing because you're working on something that you think is like meaningful for me it was important to feel like i'm doing something that's valuable now and like or 10 years from now or is like going to help and then the two kind of areas that seemed more promising there was like human health or perhaps like addressing the energy and climate crisis. And so that, I feel very good about that choice. <laughs> what I learned from all those experiences is there were many situations where I got lucky. Well, in Kenya, we spent a lot of time in rural villages and you would see a lot of people who were just as ambitious and smart and interested in things, but then their access to the same sort of education and resources was not there. No matter how smart you are or how hard you work, a big part of the reason where, why you are somewhere is just like a luck and circumstance. Um, so it makes you grateful to be where you are. It makes you very eager to give as many people as possible the resources that they, like that one piece of luck that they need to be able to use their skills. So I think I'm very obsessed with like fairness and equity. Most of the equity and inclusion work I've done for the most part has been focused on women in science largely because I think that 
in order to create something that's like useful you have to understand the problem and for me it's like i live that problem i know that world i know these people so that's where i can have be the most helpful they put me in touch with a company that was filming like PSAs for the government called She Can STEM. And it was supposed to be like you'd meet somebody who is like an elementary school child and you would like teach them something about science. I got to meet this child actor named Riley who was just tiny and precious and had like these gold curly ringlets and big blue eyes and she's like the sweetest little child ever. 3D printed a little heart shape and she wanted to know if you could 3D print with cells and I was like yeah you can do that I've actually done that before we're gonna do all these things and this was when I had just finished my PhD right so I was like 25 or so and she was like in elementary school. She emailed me like three days ago <laughs> she was like hey um I'm actually a junior in high school now. <laughs> After I met you, I got really interested in science and bioengineering and I started this science club for girls thing at her school. And then she wanted to start doing research. And so I was like, okay, let's like look at some nearby universities and some friends I know who are professors there and like find her a lab and stuff. Even though I'm not like super senior in my career, I've been doing things for long enough that you can see a lot of people grow up. Right, and you see the impact that just like existing and doing these outreach activities has. Even if none of my science ever works, one of these people's things is gonna do something.